Welcome to episode 2 of our webinar series, Penile Prosthesis in Switzerland. Thank you so much for being here today. As you know, every Wednesday of each month, we are presenting new aspects of penile prosthesis procedures. All throughout the webinar, do not hesitate to ask all of your questions in the chat section. Our speakers are going to be answering them live. Let's welcome our speakers. Dr. Carlo Betoki, Professor of Urology and Director of Andrology and External Surgery at the University of Foggia in Italy. Dr. Betoki is also President of the European Society for Sexual Medicine. Professor David Rolf is a Professor of Urology at UCLH and UCL in London, Consultant Andrologist at the Center for Reproductive and Genetic Health, he is one of the leader penile implanter in the UK and Europe. We'll be answering them live. Let's welcome our speakers. Stunt andrologist in France. He is a member of the AFU, the Association Française d'Urologie. Trained in London alongside Professor Ralph and Dr. Betoki, as well as in the United States. Dr. Rados Genovic surgeon at Savaparovic Foundation in Belgrade, Serbia. Dr. Genovic has performed surgeries in various countries such as Switzerland, China, Germany, Italy, Greece, or Thailand. Professor Daniel Chevalier is a medical and physical doctor. He is a fellow of European Board of Urology, fellow of American College of Surgeon and Education Institute, and he is a professor of urology and head of department at a university hospital in France. Let's begin with Carlo Betoki. Dear friends, dear colleagues, welcome to this new webinar. Today we will discuss about the connection of ED and diabetes, give you some more information about epidemiology, strategy, and the efficiency of medical options. My talk will cover the topic of erectile dysfunction in diabetes mellitus type 2. What do we know? And so I will try to give you uh, some details about the connection in terms of physiopathology and the causes of erectile dysfunction in diabetic people. According to the EAU guidelines 2020, the erectile dysfunction is defined as the persistent inability to obtain and maintain an erection sufficient to permit a satisfactory sexual performance. And this condition is associated with unmodifiable and modifiable common risk factors, including dyslipidemia, hypertension, cardiovascular diseases, medication, pelvic surgery, and neurological causes. Between all of them, diabetes mellitus represents one of the major causes of erectile dysfunction, reaching 30% of the total. Nowadays, type 2 diabetes mellitus has become a worldwide epidemic problem and is occurring in tandem with increasing obesity and longevity. An estimated 20 to 70 percent of men with type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus report erectile dysfunction, with an increasing incidence with older age. 49 percent of men over the age of 65 years with type 2 diabetes mellitus is affected by this condition. Moreover, diabetic men have almost a threefold higher probability to develop erectile dysfunction compared with the non-diabetics. They are also prone for the onset of ED to occur 10 to 15 years earlier. ED in diabetic men has also been shown to be more severe and associated with a poorer quality of life. Last but not least, the evidence shows that it is less responsive to medical treatment compared with ED in non-diabetic men. And in order to fully understand how diabetes uh, mellitus affects the erectile function, it is necessary to know how erectile function works itself. And so you wouldn't mind if I remind you some important passage of the physiology of erection. 
and uh, we know that the direction results from uh, uh, nerve impulses that produce a vascular and cavernosal smooth muscle relaxation, leading to increased arterial inflow to penal corpora cavernosa. This is predominantly mediated by the nitric, nitric oxide, the so-called NO, produced by uh, parasympathetic, non-adrenergic and non-cholinergic neurons, which stimulate the endothelial cells, triggering a molecular cascade, which results in relaxation of smooth muscle cells, and so the vasodilatation. Increasing blood flow impedes venous return through passive compression of subtunical venules and maintaining the erection. The pathophysiology of diabetic erectile dysfunction is various and multifactorial. There are many components, such as vasculopathy, neuropathy, hypogonadism, and local factors, which all lead to decreased erectile function because of altering the already explained mechanism. And the main component of erectile dysfunction in diabetes is vasculopathy. Diabetic vasculopathy consists of micro and micro vasculopathy endothelial dysfunction, which all play a role in the pathophysiology of the erectile dysfunction. Macrovascular disease and non complications of diabetes is thought to play an important role in the pathophysiology of erectile dysfunction by limiting the blood flow to the penis. Microvascular disease, instead associated with diabetes, leads to nerve ischemia in addition to direct nerve damage, producing autonomic and peripheral neuropathy. At the end, endothelial dysfunction is thought to precede and predispose to subsequent atherosclerosis, plaque formation and thrombosis, leading to occlusive macrovascular disease. As we said before, one of the most important mechanisms involved in erection is mediated through the endothelium by the action of nitric oxide. So the lack of NO due to endothelial dysfunction leads to insufficient relaxation of the vascular smooth muscles of the corpora cavernosa, resulting in erectile dysfunction. Diabetes is associated with both peripheral and autonomic neuropathy, and both of these can contribute to erectile dysfunction. The innervation of the penis occurs via the dorsal, penal, and perineal nerves, which carry sympathetic and parasympathetic autonomic nerves. Autonomic neuropathy is strongly associated with erectile dysfunction, and its mechanism is due to reduced or absent parasympathetic activity needed for relaxation of the smooth muscles of the corpus cavernosum. In fact, the parasympathetic tone is needed to increase NO synthetase activity. On the other hand, the pathophysiology of peripheral neuropathy is attributed to microvasculopathy and nerve toxicity that arise from several mechanisms, including increased oxidative stress. This leads to impairment of sensory impulses from the shaft and the glands of the penis to the reflexogenic erectile centers and it contributes to the reduction of the venous outflow from the cavernous bodies, caused by the passive compression of subtunical venules in the corpora cavernosa, helping to maintain the erection. And another important factor in diabetic erectile dysfunction is represented by hypogonadism. 20% of diabetic men with erectile dysfunction have a frank hypogonadism with low total testosterone level. At the cerebral level, testosterone stimulates the synthesis, the storage, and the release of proerectile neurotransmitters. At the level of the corpora cavernosa, the NOS containing parasympathetic fibers are testosterone dependent, and so testosterone withdrawal is followed by programmed cell death of cavernous smooth musculature. A low plasma concentration of sex hormone binding globulin the SHBG, the major carrier of testosterone, has been considered to be a cause of low total testosterone in diabetes, possibly related to increased insulin resistance. Local factors can also interfere with the erectile function in diabetes. An example is Peyronie's disease, that is a localized connective tissue disorder that affects the tunical buginia of the penis 
and it is uh, characterized by penile pain, plaque formation, deformity, and also erectile dysfunction. This disease is associated with the presence and duration of diabetes. Further structural changes associated with diabetes include the progressive loss of normal cavernosal endothelium and smooth muscle cells from corpus cavernosus, and increased collagen deposition and thickening of the basal lamina, leading to fibrosis. Balanitis represents another typical infectious condition in diabetic men, the irritation, pain and discharge associated with fungal balanitis could have both physical and psychological effects on erectile function and intercourse. The importance of a poor glycemic control as an indicator of reduced erectile function in diabetic men represents an important aspect of this matter. In this review, the evidence shows that the risk of erectile dysfunction is higher in type 2 diabetic men with poor glycemic control than those with a good control and the HbA1c level is significantly, significantly associated with ED risk. Patients' age, diabetes mellitus duration, peripheral neuropathy, and body mass index also has a positive association with erectile dysfunction. This will raise the importance of early screening of erectile dysfunction among diabetic men, alongside the screening of neuropathy, retinopathy, and nephropathy, already endorsed by all existing guidelines, and the importance of HbA1c control as there is supporting evidence for the reduction of diabetes mellitus complication. But nevertheless, further study are needed to better clarify this causal link because there is a lack of literature. ED in diabetic men can be treated in various ways, Control of blood glucose and other risk factors such as dyslipidemia, hypertension and weight is essential in all patients. Indeed, a combination of medical management and lifestyle changes have been proven to be useful. So we know from our EAU guidelines that the first line of treatment is represented by PD-5 inhibitors and the second line includes a transureteral application or intracavernous injection of vasoactive substance such as PG-1 or the use of vacuum constriction device. But when ED is unresponsive to all of the, this treatment that we have discussed, then there is space and indication for penile processes that is considered the third line therapy. My last slide is about the PD-5 inhibitors. Although their efficacy is about 60 to 70% in the general erectile dysfunction population, it is considerably lower in diabetic men. Sildenafil improved erection in more than 66% of men compared to 28% of men using placebo. Moreover, success rates were independent of baseline ED severity and level of glycemic control. There are no significant differences between PD-5 inhibitors in terms of efficacy and safety, but only the pharmacokinetic differences should be considered. The second line treatment represented mainly, as I said before, by intracavenous injection and intraureteral use of vasoactive drugs uh, well, unlikely, there are no studies today uh, that has been designed specifically for diabetic men, and so we have no data from literature. And uh, the actual evidence shows that 65% of men had intercourse successfully at least once using intraureteral prostate, and its efficacy was similar in all patient groups, including men with diabetes mellitus, about 21% of the study population. Moreover, a satisfactory erectile response was achieved after 99% of injection in patients using alprostadil at home. So now I think there is a space to move on the surgical treatment of erectile dysfunction in diabetic people. And so I leave the uh, talk to my colleagues and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Petoki. We're now moving on to Dr. Fex. Good evening, I am Antoine Fex and I am one of the urologists 
in uh, MISC, Men's Health International Surgical Center, located in Switzerland. My lecture today will be about sexual dysfunction and diabetes mellitus. As you know, except the rectal dysfunction, you have the possibility to have other sexual dysfunction as ejaculatory and orgasmic disorders, low libido and testosterone deficiency, depressive syndrome and anatomical abnormalities. Uh, for ejaculatory disorders, you know that the diabetic neuropathy may deteriorate the nerves controlling the external retrol sphincter and can lead to ejaculatory disorders. It may be an ejaculation by retrograde ejaculation or real an ejaculation. The exact prevalence unknown, some papers said that it will be, it should be about one patient of three after 10 years of diabetic situations. Uh, it's more often associated with erectile dysfunction. Uh, how to treat? It's uh, always difficult to may try anticholinergics, antihistaminics, alpha adrenergics, or injection of a volume forming material of collagen type 2 inside the bladder neck. Uh, you have also the possibility to have delayed ejaculation and low orgasmic disorders. Uh, you may try ephedrine sulfate treatment, sodoephedrine treatment, emipramine. The goal is increase the sympathetic tone inside the vas deferens internal sphincter, but you must treat very carefully because you have the possibility to uh, have a cardiac toxicity. Uh, you have also the possibility to have a premature ejaculation. Uh, the prevalence rate uh, is maybe roughly uh, 30%. It's more often associated with erectile dysfunction. Very often it's correlated to a poor glycemic control and you have uh, the possibility to give the classical treatment options, medical treatment and therapies, classical therapies. Uh, studies in, uh, for diabetic uh, patients uh, have consistently shown that approximately 35% of men uh, have total testosterone levels below 12 nanomoles per liter and 15% below 8 nanomoles per liter. So you may give testosterone replacement below 10.4 nanomoles per liter, it may salvage response to PDE5 inhibitors. Uh, you have uh, the possibility to have an improvement in sexual desire and morning erection, very early improvement of sexual life, independently of improvement on in erectile function score. And it uh, works especially in younger men under the age of 60, and less, of course, if you have a depression syndrome. Depression syndrome. Men with uh, diabetic mellitus have double rate of depression, approximately, approximately 25%. Uh, very often it's underdiagnosed and questionnaire may improve the diagnosis rate like the Beck scale. Uh, treatment for depression frequently worsen erectile dysfunction, desire and ejaculatory dysfunction. So it may be a worse problem after a treatment of a depression syndrome. Uh, what the explanation may be decrease of oxygenation adversely alters the response of dopamine receptors. Uh, to finish, you have the possibility to have anatomical abnormalities. Uh, for men with foreskin, you have the possibility uh, to have a balanitis and fungal infection, 60%. Uh, compared to a control group of 5%, uh, phimosis, 32%, and peronis disease with a high prevalence rate, 20% compared to 3% for a control group. As you see, for sexual dysfunction and uh, diabetic men, it's often associated with erectile dysfunction. It may precede uh, erectile dysfunction, so you need to do a global assessment of sexual 
uh, function, desire, erection, ejaculation, orgasm, mood. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Fex. We're now moving on to Professor Daniel Chevalier. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being with us for this second MISC webinar. It's a great honor for us. As you have seen on the previous um, presentation from the Professor Carol Bertocchi, PP in diabetic patients could be very challenging. The gold issue are, is it possible to keep control on material infection? And can we, um, oh. welcome us. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being with us for this second MISC webinar. We have seen on the previous um, excellent presentation from uh, Professor Keller Betterby that uh, PP in diabetic patient could be uh, very uh, challenging. Is it possible to optimize this, uh, this situation? I will propose a, um, a presentation in three, three tape approach before the procedure, surgical procedure, during surgical procedure, and after the surgical procedure. Before the surgical procedure, can we optimize the preoperative preparation? What about the patient? We need absolutely to obtain a balanced diabetes based on the glycated hemoglobin less than 7. We need to obtain a systematic diabetologist opinion because of the risk of diabetic imbalance. And we need to obtain the consent of the diabetologist. We need to search for all infectious forcing or our dental tools, sore of the field, urine, etc. And we need also to, to make a systematic search for asymptomatic cardiovascular complication in a health diabetes procedure well known by the cardiologists. Please ask to the cardiovascular cardiologists for that. This is a very important point. We know how it's very important to the counseling when you, you, you manage the, the PP placement. And it's really true for, for, the, 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 for, for the placement PP placement for the diabetic placement, because do not forget that what is discussed preoperatively is a family cancer, while the same information delivered postoperatively could be interpreted by the patient as a complication. We recommend spotter and pubic air removal during the preoperative preparation because shaving or clapping to remove scrotal air is left to the discretion of the surgeon. The, the, the main purpose is to avoid traumatic skin disruption. You can do that immediately preoperatively or one day before, that's four hours. And you can decrease the, the infection rate by the fall of 2.004. It's very, very important for us. What about the antibiotic prophylaxis? Preoperative antibiotic with gram positive and gram negative coverage should be given to a antibiotic for making surgical incision. We recommend at least one hour before incision to ensure adequate tissue level. We can use amino glycosid with vancomycin or second generation force of separospor. Just a few words about uh, the postoperative antibiotic. We recommend with some expert 
that um, uh, a possible antibiotic such a uh, premature pre cephalomyositis of 14 days um, to, to decrease the risk of a second, a second infection in postoperative uh, diarrhea. We will see this, uh, this point just uh, at the end of this uh, presentation. What about this, the skin preparation during this uh, preoperative um, period? When available, we recommend the use of alcohol-based skin preparation in the operating room. Also, this scrub require a three minutes drying time after application. They are faster than the traditional 10 minute iodine based scrub and have the added advantage of continued antibacterial activity for several hours. The famous double warp nose touch skin technique. This is during the procedure. You change step now, step two, during the procedure, surgical procedure. Double warp nose touch skin technique. This technique to minimize skin and device can decrease the inflatable PP infection rate. This is well known now. From the left to the, to the right, we can see on the photo, we apply, um, first of all, we apply um, adhesive, uh, adhesive wrap on the skin of the pass on the patient, the skin prepared by alcohol shall the shell suit. We manage an access uh, to the to the penis and the scrot. Then we put the, the scotch retractor, we make incision, and just before remove remove um, the, the implant, we apply a new um, a new drop, non-adhesive drop. This is the same drop you can use when you do your laparoscopic surgery. You manage an access to the, to the surgical wound and to the field of surgery. And you attach, you can see on the right of the, of the, of the, 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 the slide, you attach by hook uh, the, the edge of, the, of this, um, this new drop to the, to the wound of the surgical wound. And you can see also that at any moment, the implant cannot touch the skin of the patient. It's very important. We will see that all this point in on, on two, short, uh, two short videos. Adhesive drop, put on the prepare, skin by alcohol solution. You manage an access to the penis and the scrotum. That's it. And you finish the application of this uh, adhesive wrap. And that's it. And now we have right um, a new after sensing and exposition. We have right a new drop. No need drop. We manage an access to the vertical field. And you can see we attach the edge of this drop. To the room, surgical room. We use the same retractor. You can see at any moment, but you can see the, the skin of the patient and you can come out the, the implant, the prostate. Well, 
during the procedure, what about the antibody carotid implant? This is a real breakout. As shown on this slide by this author, we decrease a lot the risk of infection, material infection. If you have, you have this kind of carotid implant, you can use normal implant, but please use with emphatic, with emphatic burden, um, the antibiotic uh, solution, a lot of antibiotic solution. It's very important. Not easy to, to, to use um, a lot of uh, antibiotic solution if you have any this kind of uh, curtailed uh, implant. And what about the, the, the type of implant? Is the less we implant material, the less we, prevent, we can prevent infection? This is the normal question you, you can ask. But in this excellent publication from uh, Capo Rosso, BGU, we have no significant difference between these, these two, three types of, uh, of uh, prostate. It's an very, very important point. The patient can make uh, the, the choice. Um, the last step of the, the, the procedure, the surgical procedure, the no drain mummy dressing attached and, and the attached skin where it compressed. You can see on the left the, the, the end of the, of, this, of the the surgical procedure with the compressed warhead and attached to the to the skin, to the womb and cicatrice and the mummy dressing. This kind, these two kind of uh, dressing is to prevent the risk of uh, postoperative material contamination, no drain, and to prevent the risk of postoperative hematoma. And after the procedure, can we optimize the postoperative follow-up? Yes, yes, we can optimize the postoperative follow-up. Please, enhancing patient relationship with the surgeon, with the office, and the staff hospital. We recommend postoperative antibiotic as primitoprim sulfamestazole for 10 days. Please have a systematic search of diabetic imbalance based on the glycated hemoglobin, less than seven because not that postoperative diabetic imbalance can be synonymous with a dermal inflammation, PP. And we, we, we need to have a systematic search for all the new infection forces, especially inside a eight weeks postoperative period. This is the time to develop a protective biofilm. It's a very important point. In conclusion, how to optimize the procedure in the penile prosthesis for diabetic patients? We have said that this is no longer a surgical challenge, and these are a real and effective ways of optimizing. Thank you, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Chevalier. We're now moving on to Professor David Rolf. Thank you. Just want to now talk about the complications of, of penile implants in uh, the diabetic patient. Uh, you can see from the proper study um, from the United States uh, that the incidence uh, of diabetes when we put in these implants is about 20%. Uh, and taking in consideration the Peyronie's group at the bottom there of 9% who also usually have Peyronie's disease, you can see that um, patients having penile implants, almost 30% of them will have diabetes. So it is a big issue. These are the complications. You've, we've uh, talked about uh, infection and how to try and prevent it uh, in the previous talks. But you can see there are other issues specifically related to the diabetic patient when you come to put in your penile implant. Uh, just to, to say a few more words about uh, infection, you can see um, this is probably the biggest study of over 1,200 patients 
Um, and you can see you expect a 1% uh, risk of infection in the virgin cases. Um, but if it's diabetic, you can increase that uh, threefold. Um, and particularly also other risks is revision surgery. As you can see, it's 10% risk of infection. And if you're diabetic and you're having a revision, certainly from this study, uh, your risk was, or should I say 18% of the patients ended up with an infection. So it is quite a big issue uh, in these patients. This is the latest meta-analysis just published uh, this year of all the various large series. Um, and you can see there is a risk in the diabetic patient, but the odds ratio in this particular meta-analysis was only 1.5. Uh, you can see there's quite a range going across the board there, um, but there certainly is a, a, a risk. Just going back a slide there. Um, so if you have a traffic light situation here, uh, the increased risks in red, um, you can see you've got your diabetic status, as we said, 20 to 30 percent risk. And then, of course, the HbA1c level is quite controversial. There have been papers that say it doesn't really make any difference. And actually, it's the actually it's the serum glucose level at the time of surgery, which is more important. But I think we've all agreed now that a level of uh, at least 8.5 percent should be achieved before you start going ahead. And then, of course, in the blue, the unknown risks, obesity um, and, of course, fungal infections. Uh, and I'll come on to that in a minute because, of course, fungal infections uh, are quite common in the diabetic patient. Uh, the fungal infections, certainly from Martin Gross's paper, uh, was about 11% of patients when they cultured uh, infected penile implants. And uh, how many of you in the audience actually routinely give uh, antifungals to your patients? Or maybe you should be in the diabetic patient. Yes, we do salvage procedures for these infected implants. Uh, as you can see, the, the Mulcahy salvage rescue with about an 85% success rate in virgin patients. But of course, there are some patients that you can't do that on. So uh, as you can see, those really septic, purulent patients or the ketoacidosis. And so you can see that the diabetic patient tends to fit into this category. So uh, not only if they've got an increased risk, is that if they get infected, uh, then you're less likely to do a, a salvage procedure on them. Um, and you can see uh, when you need to do a salvage procedure, uh, and of course uh, the green bars is when, yes, it's favorable to go ahead and do your uh, conservative management and salvage. But on the red, uh, you can see the box in the corner there, um, diabetic patients um, and, uh, Basically, alarm bells start uh, ringing uh, when you have a diabetic with an infected penile implant. And of course, look at, at the bottom there, antifungals, IV antifungals. Have you given antifungal uh, to the patient? Uh, if you haven't and they're diabetic, you probably should just take the implant out. I often uh, um, I often do circumcision uh, uh, at a separate stage uh, in doing penile implants. I think if you've got just a, an uncomplicated, just a bit of a tight foreskin uh, and the patient wants a circumcision and he doesn't have any specific disease, then that's fine, just go ahead. And these are three studies looking at that uh, where you can see that the infection risk, if you do a circumcision at the same time of your penile implant, and remember in the diabetic patients, these are the patients that are likely to have problems with their foreskin. So again, we're talking about diabetic patients. And Steve Wilson's big series, they didn't seem to have any difference. This is if you have an uncomplicated problem uh, with the foreskin. Now, of course, if you see uh, any of these and you haven't examined your patients for a while, or it's been a, 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 a quite a time lag between when you saw the patients and when you've operated, you can see, some of these are absolutely terrible um, with all the smegma and clearly infected glands. Uh, and I think in this situation, perhaps you shouldn't be doing a concomitant 
circumcision at the time of your penile implant. Do your circumcision, let the wound and all of the infection settle and then come back another day. So remember, uh, foreskin issues, balanitis occurs in the diabetic patients. So make sure uh, you examine your patients and examine the foreskin. This is another little vid video clip you can see. Uh, this is in patients that do, in diabetic patients that do self-dilatation, can't get up there. There's intracavernosal fibrosis and therefore you need your sharp scissors. So you may just say this is just a, a diabetic patient having a penile implant, but actually sometimes the dilatation is quite difficult and you have to do your uh, scissor maneuver. And of course, when you have difficult dilatation in the shaft, you have more risk of tunical perforation, the urethral perforation. So just because they haven't had their, and they haven't got Peronis or it doesn't, you can't feel any fibrosis. If they are patients that have been on a, a self injection program, they're likely to have intracavernosal fibrosis at perhaps all areas of, of where they've done their injections. And so the dilatation may be a little bit more difficult. Now, Peyronie's disease. Uh, Peyronie's disease, as you know, is quite common in, uh, in the diabetic population. Um, the risk factors, uh, and I tend to say it's usually around 20% incidence uh, of diabetes in a Peyronie's patient. It depends on which country you live in, of course. Uh, if you're from the Middle East, it's probably up to 50%. Uh, this is Atesh Kadioglu's paper which shows all the vascular risk factors in Peyronie's disease. And that was, uh, as you can see, 33% of patients uh, in his series had vascular disease. So you have a, it's quite common uh, in, to have both of these conditions. Um, these are the indications, of course, for inserting a penile implant in Peyronie's disease. Uh, and you can see at the bottom when grafting is not appropriate. Um, and grafting is not appropriate in the diabetic patient by and large. So if you've got, if you want to get erectile dysfunction post-operatively after grafting, uh, then it's going to be in the diabetic patients. So it is a significant risk when you start thinking about doing grafting in Peyronie's disease. And remember, 20 to 30% of you, these patients are going to be diabetic. And when you look at the long-term follow-up in these groups of patients, and particularly Eric Chung's paper that you can see 67% of patients end up with erectile dysfunction. And these are because they have vascular disease and diabetes to start with. So when you're thinking about plaque incision, perhaps you may actually think, well, you know what? These patients with diabetes and Peyronie's disease might be better off um, with, uh, with a penile implant. <clears throat> The next issue, of course, with Peyronie's disease is you can have this distal flaccidity, uh, particularly uh, when you've got intracavernosal fibrosis at the tip. Um, and then, of course, it's very difficult to get uh, your dilatation all the way up into the glands. Um, and in this situation, you end up, and the MRI scan will show you you've got tissue there uh, distally, uh, distally to your prosthesis and the floppy glands. Um, so don't be afraid to do a second incision if you're having difficulty. You really do need to feel confident to get your penile implant right up into the glands uh, because otherwise you're going to be doing a revision procedure for like uh, uh, either changing the cylinders or a glandular plexi. So satisfaction with Peyronie's disease and you can see um, uh, the table at the bottom there. Um, the general satisfaction is around about 80, 90 percent, but there are groups of patients, uh, particularly the Peyronie's groups of patients, the obese groups of patients that don't reach those satisfaction levels. And that's usually because of penile shortening. But of course, in the Peyronie's group of patients and consequently the diabetic patients, um, they may have residual curvature, penile shortening. Um, and it's just not the same as it used to be. And so the satisfaction levels are much less. <clears throat> so Peyronie's disease plus diabetes, worse patient satisfaction levels. The final thing I want to talk about is uh, the major complications. And this is when we're trying to increase the length uh, in our patients 
usually because they've lost length uh, from fibrosis, either after uh, uh, explantation, infection, or of course, due to Peyronie's disease itself. There's a whole host of different operations, as you can see here, um, and different techniques um, to try and lengthen the penis. All, of course, become more risky with regards to complications. The sliding technique, um, this involves quite extensive mobilization, both of the neurovascular bundle and of the urethra. Um, and by and large, the more mobilization you have of the tissues, particularly in a diabetic patient, then of course, the more risk there is. And the risk of course here, with all of these extensive mobilizations is glans necrosis. This is a partial glans necrosis but of course you can have total glands necrosis or even cavernosal tissue, uh, the tunica itself become necrosed. And so this is a complete disaster um, in, in, uh, in penile implant surgery. When we looked at a, a series of 19 patients with glands necrosis, then guess what? One of the major risk factors was diabetes. Um, and to some extent now, diabetes and other vascular risk factors because if you mobilize it, you're going to uh, disrupt all those tributaries um, between the neurovascular bundle, the urethra, and of course the glands uh, perfusion, uh, and particularly in the diabetic patients. So I'd have to say, just beware of extensive mobilization. I've actually had a glands necrosis by just mobilizing the dor dorsal neurovascular bundle in a Pironi's patients. Um, so it, it is quite risky in these patients and by, by and large, the more you mobilize, the more risk. And I would have to say that uh, in a poorly controlled diabetic or a bad diabetic, uh, just keep things simple and maybe just placate the other side rather than starting doing grafting procedures. Of course, if you're modeling as then um, that has not been successful. Okay, so um, that's all I have to say at the moment. Uh, we've got another lecture following this, uh, but we're open for questions uh, uh, that you deem fit. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, please save the date for our next webinar on Wednesday, May 5th, and follow us on our social media, LinkedIn, and our YouTube channel. Thank you so much.